Amen. Well, we could go home after that. That wasn't a joke, but I do believe God has more for us. So you could be seated in the presence of the Lord. Great to be with you. Uh, I have learned, and I don't know if you've learned this, and I'm going to take my jacket off because it's going to make me more anointed. But I have learned that God has a sense of humor. How many know that? If you read the Bible, you know that God has a sense of humor. But every time I stand in front of people, I realize that God has a sense of humor. (laughs) Because I never desired to be in ministry. And uh, 20 years ago, I had a life-changing surrender moment with the Lord. And here I am. It's literally taken me around the world. And, and one of the things that I have learned is your greatest life is hidden in your surrender to God. It's, it gets real fun when you want to do it his way. It really does. You know, um, it's interesting. I've observed something interesting with believers. I've been thinking about this the last month is many believers want to go to heaven. They're all in on heaven but they're not quite in on doing everything God tells them to do. So why do they want to go to heaven? Because he's in charge of everything in heaven. I mean, what are you going to get at mad, mad at God when he says something? I like a church that gets excited about giving. You guys got excited about giving, but like, what are you going to do when he starts talking about money in heaven? You going to leave? I ain't like what you said. Where are you going now? <laughs> Jesus didn't let me sing the special. I'm leaving. Okay. (laughs) But one of the ways you really know you want to go to heaven is if you do what he tells you now. We'll talk maybe more about this this morning, but one of the great things about God is everything he's asked you to do, he's given you the power to do. He's already given you the strength. He's like, surrender. He goes, and I'm going to give you the strength to do it. You just got to agree with him. He really does have a really good life for every person in this room. Uh, Real quickly, we have a resource table uh, back there. I wrote a book about three or four years ago. And how many are in Christ today? Uh, Yeah, if you're in Christ, hopefully today after you leave, and you, if someone said, I want to know the God that you serve, you go, okay, let me lead you to the Lord. And in a moment of time, you could lead them to the Lord, hopefully. It doesn't take real long. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, you're in the kingdom. But then they said, oh, I got a pain in my neck. Hopefully you can go, well, my God takes care of that. And they go, well, I've been depressed for six years. My God takes care of that. I got a kid on drugs. My God takes care of that. I haven't worked in eight years. My God takes care of that. And pretty soon, hopefully, any problem they would have, you'd be able to go, my God takes care of that. See, we had amens for that one, but what God is desiring for the people of God to do is he is trying to get us to believe that for cities, regions, and nations of the world. The blood of Jesus and the kingdom of God were given to us not just for individual salvation, but for nations. He's, and, and the people in this room... I'm American, proud to be an American citizen. Don't ever ever be ashamed of that. When I first started traveling internationally, like there used to be this, oh, you're American. And I was like, you know what? I know my allegiance is to the kingdom of God, but God God is the one who created nations and boundaries. You know, that's God who did that. So I'm not ashamed to be an American, but also as an American, we carry a responsibility to steward our nation. And God is going to judge not only individuals, but nations one day. And we will be responsible for what we did for our nation. So that's what that book is about. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I kind of had a story that goes with it. So if you like stories, you can read the stories and then it leads into a teaching. If you just like teaching, you could, ju- read the, uh, you could just read the teaching in the book. If you don't like to read, you will never grow. <laughs> leaders are readers. 
So that's back there. Also, real quickly, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit on this subject today. This is a whole series on the subject of faith. Pretty big deal. If without faith, you can't please God. And then uh, every year, probably for the last uh, seven, eight years, the Lord gives me uh, some understanding of this coming season. So it's a whole audio, uh, seri- uh, audio teaching on the word of the Lord for this year. Also, there's uh, the written version on there so you can write it. I put the word of God everywhere I go. You should too. I keep it before me, keep it around me, keep it beside me, because God can't trust me to listen to certain things. I just got to keep the word in front of me. Uh, so uh, that's available to you. Really, you should buy everything on that table. I'm not, that's not a joke. But if you want, <laughs> and no, I encourage you to get it. We try and really produce things that equip people. Um, that was an amazing testimony, wasn't it? Really amazing. Uh, two things before we just get into the word of God. If you want to turn, and we'll, we'll get there I believe in a moment, to Hebrews chapter 11. Did you bring your Bibles today? Hope you did. People died to put that book in your hands. They really did. Read the book, meditate on the book, and then manifest the book in everything that you do. Is uh, Oh, there she is. Tammy, uh, I believe the word of the Lord came to me for you this morning, but... um, the Lord began to uh, show me your life, and since you were in your mother's womb, you've been called for the purposes of God, and God has set you apart for such a time as this, and uh, you have been very, very faithful in someone else's vineyard, but the Lord says there is a call, and you will know there is a call to the nations of the earth. I even hear like the sounds of the voices of people in other nations who will call you to come. Your feet will touch in Asia. Your feet will touch in South America. Your feet will touch all over this nation as a voice and an ambassador for the kingdom of God. And the favor, the Lord says, the favor of God is upon you. The favor of God is upon you that will open doors to speak in front of heads of state presidents, influential leaders, and even heads of corporation, because the Lord says this is a season of even preparation for a even greater purpose and greater platform in the things of the Lord. And the Lord says, right, right as you've never owned, because there's an angel today being assigned to you to write. There's, I see at least three books, manuals, curriculums inside of you, and the Lord says that this will be, uh, the next three years of your life will be a season of acceleration of the purpose of God and the giftings inside, inside of your life, and the word of the Lord to you is what you don't know is inside of you is already inside of you. So the Lord says that this is a, a beginning and an inauguration of a new season in the things of God. Why don't you just lift your hands for a moment? This man said something, this 90-year-old man said something that spurred in me. He said, I came, or I I started this whole journey when um, revival was hitting this nation. And the Lord says that When July 1st came in this year, July 1st, 2018, there was a spirit of acceleration released to this nation. And the Lord says, I opened a door over this nation into the glory of the Lord. And the Lord says, what is coming in this next season will be new, but it will merge with the old and the new. And the Lord says, there is a flood in the land. There is a flood from the east coast to the west coast in this season. There's a flood in the land. It is a flood washing away wrong structures, wrong religious mindsets in the people of God. And the Lord says, I am positioning the people of God to inherit the greatest move of God the world has ever seen. And the Lord says, there will be indeed even a third great awakening that the first two will not touch. And the Lord says, the reason I'm I'm saying this even today, because the Lord says, this is holy and consecrated land. The ancient of days has consecrated this land since the very foundation of the earth. And the Lord says, arise, Rock Church, because I'm going to make you a key part of this third great awakening in the purposes of the Lord. (laughs) 
Thank you, Lord. I'm telling you, when she said there's an open heaven, I saw that in worship. Whatever you have need of, it's here in this room. There's just a, a blanket of healing in this room. Somebody's right shoulder, the Lord is healing somebody's right shoulder. Be healed in Jesus' name. Right knee, just be healed in Jesus' name. The Lord is healing arthritis now. Be healed. The fire of God is on you. Receive healing from arthritis. Somebody of you battled, it's a, it's a generational thing of headaches, and the Lord is healing your headaches. Fire of God is on you. Be delivered now in Jesus' name. That's a spirit of infirmity that's in your bloodline, and the Lord says, be healed in Jesus' name. So, Lord, thank you for this morning. Now, open up your word to us, Lord. Thank you for the open heaven. Let miracles take place even through the teaching of your word. Father, I need your help. Without you, I can't do anything, but with you, I can do all things. Let the impossible happen in this room. Thank you for the open heaven. Thank you that this is Bethel. Thank you that this is the gate of heaven. This is the place where angels ascend and descend on the Son of Man. Thank you for the angel of the Lord that sent as a ministering spirit today to help us. Guide us, Holy Spirit, you said you would guide us into all truth, so guide us into all truth today. Father, let, it, let, let the word of God burn in us today. We're hungry for your word. Let it be like those two disciples on the road to Emmaus, that their hearts burned as you, as you open the word. So wonderful Jesus, open up your word to us. Glorify your son. Let it, like, let it be like Hebrews 2 verse 9, that we would see Jesus a little lower than the angels and crowned unto glory. Yeah. Glorify your son. In Jesus' name, amen. amen, amen. Hebrews chapter 11, if you've been in the body of Christ for a while, it's kind of uh, the chapter of faith. We don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. And... Uh, we're going to talk about the, the concept of faith today. Obviously, you can't exhaust the, the topic of faith in one setting, so this will be foundations of faith. Possibly the Lord will, will allow me to do uh, part two to, tonight. I, I think he might, but I don't want to guarantee it because I never know sometimes. So Hebrews chapter 11, excuse me, and verse one. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. That word substance is this, the ultimate reality that underlines all outward manifestation and change. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, and obviously the, the, the next line goes right along with that, the evidence of things not seen. And I just wanna make this point and keep it in mind and hopefully we'll develop it as we go along this morning, that the unseen realm governs the seen realm. Everything you see in the earth has been governed by an unseen realm. And the unseen realm is more important than the seen realm because the unseen realm determines what is in the seen realm. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. Notice that the elders obtained good testimony because they had faith. Verse three, by faith, we understand. That's another important principle. Hopefully, we'll look at in a minute. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen are not made of the things which are visible. Notice that concept there that we just touched on. The things which are seen are not made of things which are visible. The things which are seen are not made of things which are visible. Now skip on to verse six just for the sake of time. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and he is 
a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So obviously, faith is an extremely important principle. If without him, you can't please him. And I want to look at, at certain things about the very nature of God that I believe helps us understand faith. And, 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 and if you want to follow along this morning, we'll probably use a bunch of scripture. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. To understand faith, you also have to understand in part how God operates in the earth. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 12. Now on the next day, when they'd come out from Bethany, he was hungry. Notice the humanity of Jesus. And seeing from a fig tree, uh, uh, and seeing a, a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for the figs. In response, Jesus said, let no no, uh, let no one eat, from, eat fruit from you ever, it's these teeth, from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Now, there's a little minor story in there about Jesus overturning the, the, the tables and the temple. It's very, very minor to the Bible. <laughs> but we pick up the story in verse 20. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots, and Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you have cursed has withered away. Verse 22, really, really important to understand faith. So Jesus answered him and said to him, I'm reading of the New King James, have faith in God. So first thing we want to look at here for a moment is this that Jesus speaks to a tree. Jesus speaks to a tree, and then obviously they go to the temple, they come out the next day, Peter looks at that tree and he notices exactly what Jesus told that tree to do happened. All you could hear was what Jesus said and then what he said happened. And then, immediately, when Peter's amazed at what, hap- what has happened to that tree, Jesus goes into this teaching on faith. Now, the New King James says, have faith in God. Actually, the best translation of this, and it's in the Bible, uh, 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 the Bible in basic in English, and I, I've studied this for a, a number of years, and they, uh, one, one leading Greek scholar who is no charismatic says, the best translation of that is, have God's faith. Amen. Have God's faith. Now, that's, that's an extraordinary understanding, and it's the first thing that Jesus points to when he's going to give Jesus this lesson on faith. So, it can be established through what Jesus just said is that God actually operates in faith. That's amazing to me. So the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are obviously three distinct persons, one God. And they are this community, and when they choose to operate in the earth, they have complete confidence that what they're desiring to do will be fulfilled in the earth. And then Jesus makes this statement, we'll hopefully look at it a little more, Jesus says, have that type of faith. Now, God is obviously not a person. He is a spirit according to John the fourth chapter. It says God is a spirit. So God is a spirit who operates in faith. Where do we see in the Bible God operating in faith? I believe the apostle Paul gives us some understanding when he's talking about Abraham, but also the context is faith, and we see how, how God puts this through the apostle Paul. Romans 4, verse 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. You should say amen if you're in Christ, because that's also you. I'm not Jewish by birth, I'm Jewish by adoption. I'm adopted in. So I'm of the faith of Abraham, 
who is the father of, of us all, verse 17, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. Excuse me again. In the presence of him who believed God, who gives life to the dead, and here it is, and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Now, obviously, he's, he's referring to Abraham there, but it's also referring to how God operates in the earth. And we see, and, and I, always, I always say this, keep this in mind as good students of Scripture. To understand God, you have to start in Genesis. Uh, Genesis 2, Revelation, or if you're real Pentecostal, you say Revelations. <laughs> Through the cross of Jesus... You can, under, you, you can only understand the Bible through the full counsel of God. You cannot understand God simply through a New Testament understanding. You will miss an aspect of the very nature of God. Paul says, who's an apostle, all scripture is God-breathed. And what? Is profitable for doctrine. So, the doctrine must be built on both. I get very nervous around people who mock things in the Old Testament. Because if you don't understand, and I don't believe God is schizophrenic. He's not a legalistic God in the old and suddenly gets kind in the new. He was always good. Amen. So to really understand God, and, and especially to understand God's desire as New Testament people, you better read the book of Genesis. So if you, if you read the book of beginnings, the book of, I call it God's divine design, the very first book of the Bible, Genesis 1, verse 1, when time began. I use that phrase, when time, because how many know that you serve a God who has no beginning and a God who has no end? It's very interesting about God. When you were born, he already had the end of your life figured out. That's good news. When time began, God created the heavens and the earth. That's really, really important right there. God is a spirit again. He doesn't need a place to live. But he creates a place called heaven, so he shows us what the earth is supposed to look like. God chooses to live in heaven. You'll see here in a minute, the only place he is in the earth is when he is in man. I'm going to try. <laughs> Verse 2, the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. Notice this, that the earth is out of order. It's not as God intends and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So we know, what does God do here? I, and, and I often say this, he could have just said, Hey, hey guys, I spoke the universe into existence, but he is illustrating a sermon. Also notice this, God does not create something out of nothing. He creates it out of the faith he's operating in. That's how powerful faith is. According to 1 first, uh, uh, first Samuel 2 verse 35, the writer describes God as having a heart and a mind. God is very, very intentional. Very, very, very intentional. So when he's speaking, he is speaking the desire that he has for the earth. And his desire is birthed through the words out of his mouth. This is how powerful the word of God is. Genesis 1, verse 3 through 5, God spoke and light appeared. Genesis 1, 11 through 13, God spoke, earth, green, grow up, grow all varieties. Genesis 1, 14 and 15, God spoke, lights, lights come on. Genesis 1, 20 and 23, God spoke. You think he's trying to make a, a, a point there, huh? <laughs> then verse 26 is just uh, verse 26 through 31 is absolutely full of understanding of how God is operating the earth. Notice there that God is speaking. He's calling things, be not as though they are, and they are. Now he is creating the crown jewel of his creation right here, Genesis 1, 26. Then, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them, that's a big part, let them, 
have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over all the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created a male and female, he created them. Just as a side note, again, when you look at the Bible, understand it through, you have to understand it through the lens of what can build a healthy society. One of the reasons you see such an attack on gender roles in the earth today is because it is the foundation of healthy societies. You don't have a man and a woman in proper relationship, whole society is distorted. Be fruitful. And God said to him, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said to them, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to it shall be food. And also to every beast, uh, to every beast of the earth, every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life, I have given you every herb of food, and it was so. Let's look at a few things very, very quickly there. Number one, in verse 26, man is made in the image of God. That means likeness, modeled, pattern, resemblance. Every human being has been given an aspect of the personality of God. Why are people important? Because they're made in the image of God. Every person you come into contact with is important to God, and so you treat them according to that perspective. Now... You are not a little God, but if you are in right relationship with God, God intends you to be the closest thing to him on the planet. Number of years ago, I I received an email from my father, and my father uh, escaped to this country in 1969. No one's trying to escape to get into Cuba, even for their free health care or education. (laughs) That nervous laugh from some people. So I, my dad came to this country with absolutely, literally no, nothing. And I got this picture, and it was from the farm he grew up in in Puerto Rico. And when I looked at the picture, I was amazed, because he's no more than five years old. They think he's maybe three or four. And it looked exactly like I did that age, at that age. He's a good-looking boy, amen? <laughs> so I am not a little god. But if I am operating correctly, I am the closest thing to God on the planet. I got one amen, it's still true. Even if you so don't say amen, it's still true. <laughs> two, defining, two defining phrases, too, also that we just read. Let them, in verse 26, and over all the earth. Notice, God doesn't say, let us have dominion. He says, let them have dominion. And then he says, over all the earth, over all the earth, over all the earth, over all the earth, over all the earth. Really big deal for believers to have a Christian worldview. From that moment forward, God is so committed to his word that he actually gives man the choice of governing the earth. Man became a owner of the earth with stewardship responsibilities. Psalm 8, you've given him dominion over the works of his hand. Psalm 112, the heavens, even the heavens are the Lord, but the earth, what? Belong to the sons of men. From that moment forward, God is so committed to his word that if he's going to operate in the earth, he's going to have to find a man or a woman who agrees with him. So it's important to know that. That while God is sovereign over all the earth, he is not responsible for everything taking place. If God is in charge, he's not doing a very good job. It's quiet when you say that. Verse 28, and then he blessed them. I like that. The blessing of the Lord is God's empowerment upon humanity. It is him going... All of me is now on all of you, and I bless you. You cannot even imagine the life I have for you. I have things stored up for you, and my greatness is now upon you. I bless you. I empower you. I release goodness on you. Glory. 
the hand of the Lord was on man. And notice, there's not anything he did to earn it. This never has anything to do with what you could earn in God. The blessing of the Lord was also to live an abundant life forever. There's a lie that exists, maybe because sometimes we haven't done such a good job of articulating. Your best life is in Christ. People are like, oh, it's really hard. And I know there's a surrender. I know sometimes we will suffer for the cause of Christ, but the blessing of the Lord is made to give you good life on the earth. You know what's hard? What's hard is trying to do it your way. What's hard is waking up with a hangover. What's hard is trying to figure out how to pay your bills. That's hard. Verse 28, and God said to them, God said to them, notice how does Adam know what to do? The voice of God. The voice of God gave him understanding of his call to be a steward of the earth. That voice is supposed to be your divine connection to heaven. Last verse in there, it says, see, I've given you every herb which yields seed on the face of the earth and every tree whose fruit yields seed to itself, to it shall be food. Now, the reason I'm reading that, maybe you thought I got off on faith, but it's all really, really important to God's divine intent. And it's this, that humanity was never created to take care of itself. Everything that Adam needed was in that garden or he could find it in God. I mean, can you imagine Adam looking at Eve and going, how are we going to pay the light bill? Where are we going to live? How are we going to pay for the kids' tuition? Everything that Adam needed, he could find in God. You were not created to take care of yourself. He was made as God's representative and God's ambassador. And he whom God has sent, God takes care of. All of his needs can be found in God. He didn't need to go anywhere else. Now, you'll see the pattern in Genesis 1 where God speaks, God speaks, God speaks, God speaks. He transferred ownership to Adam. Now, God brings the animals to Adam and he sees what Adam would name them. Let's look at uh, Genesis 2, 19. Out of the ground, the Lord, this is 2.19 if you follow along, formed every beast of the field, every bird of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. Notice, Adam did not have that thing that a lot of believers had. Whatever you want, God. What do you want to do? God is looking at Adam. Why? Because, and keep this in mind in your relationship with God. Once God speaks something to you, he makes you responsible for it. There are certain things as believers that you no longer need to pray about. Because God goes, this is what I've called you to do. And he brought them to Adam. And this is a picture of life in the kingdom of God. God is always the source of all things. Really, really important. Never, ever think you're the source. If you think you're the source, you're probably going to mess this thing up. He's the source, but he invites Adam to do what he's called to do. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to all the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. So Adam now, now notice notice the sequence there. God speaks, God speaks, God speaks. Adam, you're in charge. Hear the animals. Who is speaking now? Adam is speaking. But here's something important to keep in mind here. I believe those animals did not know if there was a difference between God speaking or Adam speaking because Adam was speaking God's word. What's the point? The world was supposed to be governed by the word of God. Notice too, there's there's another thing I want to look at there too that's extremely important there. How was Adam 
qualified to name those animals. There's no verse in there that says Adam went four years to Old Dominion to get his degree to learn how to name those animals. Adam has no textbook. What qualifies him to name those animals is the voice of God in Genesis 1 and also an understanding of what they were supposed to be called. Adam is not governed by reason, intellect, or anything like that. He is governed by a brilliant mind that God has given him. So it's another gift that you've been given if you're in Christ. You've been given the gift of a brilliant mind. Now, we know what happened that upset God's original intent. Genesis 3. We don't know if it's the next day. Genesis 3, here comes the devil. Now, notice there that in Genesis 1, God doesn't tell Adam anything about the devil. All he does, have dominion and subdue. What's he telling him? You are over the devil. The devil was made for you to have dominion over. Listen, God, devil, there is, they're not opposites. No one's buying that pay-per-view. God doesn't even need to think about the devil and he's dead. But I'm telling you, like, this is, God has a sense of humor. Think about this. He could have just destroyed the devil after he sinned. He leaves him around. And he goes, okay, devil, this is what I'm going to do. Excuse me. Since you want worship, I'm going to leave you on the earth. And I'm going to make something I've never made before. I'm going to make a man in my image. And I'm going to give him power over you. And since you want worship, everything that they do is going to be a worshipful act unto me. Notice he put him in a garden. He didn't put him in a prayer room. Why? Everything you do unto God can be a worshipful act unto God. There's no secular and spiritual in God. And he goes, since you want worship, I'm going to give them power over you. And every time they worship me, they'll exercise dominion over you. And you'll know that you're not even close to anything that I've ever created. And then one day I'm going to destroy you, but I'm going to drive you nuts for thousands of years. Yeah. Here's an interesting thing, though. He doesn't make man a robot. The voice of God allows the authority of God to operate through Adam. Now, the enemy comes in a form of a snake. He is able to dialogue with Eve and then eventually Adam. So, we know that they listen to the wrong voice. This is also really important for us. The most predominant voice that you listen to in your life will define your life. It's a perfect world. You didn't need version 2.0 of the earth. It was absolutely perfect in every way. Adam was made absolutely perfect. He listens to the wrong voice, the DNA of it. Don't ever believe your choices don't matter. Really, really, ask Adam when you get to heaven. That's a lot of time on Dr. Phil's couch in heaven. (laughs) Perfect, not perfect, your fault. The DNA of man is corrupted and the DNA of earth is corrupted forever. And something came into existence that God never intended. Man was never created to take care of himself, but when he sins, he begins to look at himself and go, some people think it was because the glory of God was on him. There's many different thoughts of of why he he realizes he's naked, but here's the thing. Also, the innocence of man was lost from that day forward. All Adam knew when he walked with God was the goodness and the knowledge of God. Now, the good news is when we're in Christ, we actually can be, we can be delivered from this world system and come back into innocence. 
I got one amen, it's still true. But what do they do? Immediately, Genesis 3, not looking at it just for sake of time, they look inward. The owner of the earth is trying to figure out how to clothe himself with a fig tree. Sin will steal your dignity. I'm telling you, there's nothing in hell you want. You say, oh, I'm just going to have this little thing over here. No, 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 no. I know young people, been around the things of God their whole life. One time they try marijuana, and without a miracle, their mind is forever broken. Because the enemy doesn't play fair. He doesn't just come in just for a part of your mind. He wants the whole thing. He's looking for a body to op- occupy. So a system comes into place. It's the Babylonian system. What's the Babylonian system? It's simply this. Don't think Hal Lindsey. Don't think 666. Don't think Perry Stone. <laughs> Just think this, Babylonian system, it's man's way of trying to make it in this world without God. How am I going to make it? What am I going to do? And this whole world system is cursed. Even if you're quote unquote successful. I was watching a a documentary, I don't spend a lot of time watching these type of things, but I had a a free night in Puerto Rico about a year and a half ago, and I turned on the TV and uh, when I was watching the TV, I, I, I was, it was like this, this show about a young man who is extremely successful in real estate. He lives in Manhattan, I think like $12 million apartment and stuff, and he runs this real estate firm. And he's about to get married, and his fiance goes, I need your help, I need your help, you're working so hard, all that stuff. And he stops and he says, he says to her, he said, no, you don't understand. I have 22 employees who need me to do well. And I said, isn't that interesting? The world says that that's success. He's living in a place in the world that 98, 99.9% of the people cannot even come close to even paying the, the, the rent to be on the sidewalk. Yet he's believed the lie of the world system. I must take care of myself. I can, I can make this in my own strength. I can do it. Now that's, that's a really big place even for believers, even as Americans. Do you know one of the manifestations of pride is the inability to receive? And you can never manifest the kingdom properly unless you learn how to be a good receiver. The good news, we know, was this, that even before this whole thing went the wrong way, Jesus had already stepped up and said, I'll take the place of humanity. Revelation 13, he was what? The lamb slain before the foundation of the earth. And this is amazing to me. God didn't need to improve upon Adam but he actually did with Jesus. That's amazing to me. In the garden, man walked with God. In Christ, for the first time in history, through Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit now indwelt a man. Think about the beauty of Jesus. When you look at Jesus, I encourage you to do this when you read the Gospels. When you look at Jesus, you will see everything that God desired for Adam. He wanted Adam to be sinless. He wanted Adam to listen to his voice. How do we know it's possible for Adam to walk on water? Because Jesus walked on water. He was the second Adam, but here's the best part. He was the last Adam. Because after Jesus, you don't need anyone else. And so God made a way, we know, through Jesus. Jesus did not just come 
to just display what God could do. He came to display what God intended for humanity. He could have just ended this whole thing after he came. And notice the focus of Jesus' teaching was not to make them ready for heaven. It's very, very important. It's important to know the goal of God. The goal of God is not to get you to heaven. The goal of God is to teach you how to live like heaven, like heaven on earth, and then eventually you inherit the kingdom forever. That's really important. It's important to know the focus of God. God's focus for your life is not to get you to heaven. So what does he do? Even in our unregenerated state, he gives to all of humanity to respond to the gospel message, the measure of faith. Really good. God knew our, whole, our, whole, our old life outside of him was so messed up that he actually gives us the ability to get back into his original intent. You couldn't even do it on your own. This is where it gets really good news. You don't have to do it on your own. Here's how the apostle Paul put it, Romans 12. Verse 3, for I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than you ought. Notice there, he's emphasizing that this is a work of God. But to think soberly, as God, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Why is faith so important? Because it was the primary way God wanted to function with Adam. He wanted Adam to have complete trust in him. That's why it's so important. And the good news is he gives you. However you got born again, you you got born again only through the measure of faith that God gave you to respond to the gospel message. Whether it was through a dream, whether it was through a, a gospel crusade. However you heard of him, you could only respond to that through what God already himself gave you. This is really good. Everything that we do for God, he first gives us in him, through him. So when we obey him, we're actually giving him back what he's first given us. It's a beautiful thing. That's why you need to keep witnessing. You need to keep believing for your children. You keep hitting that thing. I just felt that in the room. Do not give. I got a brother. He thinks, he thinks, he, he thinks he's not going to serve the Lord. I said, you got a problem. So you're born in the wrong family. This whole family's getting born again. And I don't pray nice prayers. Some of you do, I don't. I don't want, I don't want the enemy to hurt him, but I said, God, make him miserable all the days of his life till he serves you. Let everything, no, I'm serious. I, 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 know, I know now they're praying these nice prayers. My, I didn't learn how to pray like that. Lord, make him absolutely miserable till he serves you, God. Let everything he ever tries on his own strength fall apart till he gives to you. Send people his way every, everywhere he goes to serve you, God. Don't kill him, but make him miserable. <laughs> Ephesians 2, for by grace you've been saved through faith. See, you can't even receive grace except through faith. Not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared before him that we should walk therein. We can use the measure of faith by placing our faith in God. According to Deuteronomy 30, God gives you a choice. He says that we won't look at it. I, I place before you blessing and cursing. You're like, how, how would God curse anyone? Listen, this world system is cursed. So when you choose to, to not obey God, you choose to not walk in faith, everything you're walking in is cursed at his roots. God can't curse you. He, just, he doesn't do that. But if you choose to walk outside of his boundaries, you are cursed because you're walking in the legal world of the enemy. I know it's true. It's important also to define what biblical faith is. Biblical faith is not simply going, I believe that Jesus died on the cross. It's not simply going, Jesus, you, you, uh, I believe that Jesus did miracles. I believe that he, he rose from that. That's not biblical faith. That's mental agreement. 
This is important, especially in our culture. Because a lot of people will tell you, oh, I believe that's true. I, believe, I was just in London. Lord Jesus, the Muslims are more bold than most believers are. They'll tell you what they believe. They'll tell you they'll kill you if you don't. I'm telling you. I'm, not, I'm being very serious. I didn't want to get any more Ubers. Because I could feel that thing. We believe in Jesus. No, you believe in your form of Jesus. Biblical faith is not just, I believe that's true. Biblical faith is, can only be based on God's revelation of himself. Amen. Really important. Because there's a lot of people, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I also live an immoral lifestyle. Oh, God, God, God loves me just the way I am. No, he wants to love the hell out of you. I have a friend, very brilliant man, Berkeley, went to Berkeley, he's, he, he's got way too many degrees. I'm joking, he's just really smart. When he starts talking, I understand about 10% of it. He said, do you understand? And I go, try again. <laughs> See, when you, biblical faith is not taking what you want about God. This is really important because a lot of people are adding Jesus to their spirituality. What did he say? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So he does not negotiate with you. You can agree that you love this sermon. You can agree on certain principles. You can agree that he loved. But if you don't agree on everything that he says about himself, it's not biblical faith. It's really important. But he, 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 in college, again, it's like a, you just keep pounding on that thing because it's what you were born to live for. His friend, the, these guys in school, he, he grew up going to Catholic church and these guys in school said to him, he said, Dave, they'd start telling him about the gospel message, but he thought anyone who would ever become born again has gotta be stupid. But that thing was working in his heart. So he's, on his do- he's, he's in his dorm room on his bed and he goes, he goes, God, I, I, know that you're, I know that you're true, but I don't want to be stupid. That's what he told God. You can be very transparent with God. I am too. Sometimes a little too honest. And he said, I heard the voice of God. He said, the voice of God said, no deal. So you don't come to God and go, hey, I want to still hold on to this. Next night, he goes, all right, God, I'm all in. I give everything to you. He said, deal. True biblical faith is putting your complete trust that takes you out of yourself into him. God, I completely surrender all my rights from this day forward. And from this day forward, how do you know that you, you're trusting God with something? If you're willing to live your whole life based upon what you're trusting. Yeah, that's, right. that's real biblical faith. Yeah. I got a few claps, but it's still true. <laughs> you don't get to negotiate with God. That's real biblical faith. So we put our complete trust in him. And then our origins of our faith, we come in to, to, to the kingdom of God by faith, and then the master key to unlock the life God intended for you, for, for, uh, the, the life God intended for you upon the earth is by faith. Some people think they need God, well, I really, if, if your life is like this, you need to readjust. Some people think like, okay, I really need to trust God for this, I really need to trust God for this, but this I can kind of handle on my own. Here's what I've learned to live a lifestyle of faith. Because a lot of people are very, they understand. I didn't get into the kingdom. I didn't get into the kingdom in my own strength. I I know I did it by faith. But they're doing a lot of other things in their own strength. A lifestyle of faith is found in, uh, in the Beatitudes that Jesus teaches. Blessed are the poor in spirit. What is that? God 
I need you to get up in the morning. God, I need you for my next pair of socks. God, I need you to, for supernatural strength to do this. You need God for everything. But here's where it gets really, really good. When you come into the kingdom, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit take complete responsibility for you. And everything that you would ever need upon this earth, they've already taken care of the relationships you would need, the money you would need, the, 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 right, the house you would need, the land you would need. Everything you would ever need for has been taken care of before you came to the earth. It's what Jesus said in John 20, verse 22. As the Father is sending me, now I am sending you. few more principles. You have a few more moments? My dear brother said she's not concerned about time, so I'm just going to go with that. (laughs) Here's what Paul said, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7, for we live by faith and not by sight. First John 5 not the, not the gospel, the epistle. Whoever believes that Jesus Christ is born of God and everyone who loves him, who begots him, who also loves him, who is begotten by him, by this we know that we love the children of God, that when we love God, we keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. It's important. Listen, please, please, Get deliverance. If you think about, well, can I still do this and let God be okay with it? When you're in love with someone, you don't think according to those lines. You don't ever want to touch anything that could hinder your fellowship with that person. When I see people asking those questions, I just realize they need an upgrade in the goodness of God. They need an upgrade in their fellowship with God. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Why is that so important? Because of this. God's desire for you to overcome is not just for you and your family. It is a fundamental way that the gospel is displayed. That though you're in this world, you're not subject to the things of this world. Though, you're mis- though, though you could be abused, though you could be taken advantage, you, you respond correctly. Though the economy of this world goes down, you still have more than enough. Though every, you respond differently because it becomes an invitation to the world around us. The world lives in deficit when the people of God do not understand faith and the kingdom of God. You were created to overcome. And this is it. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. Here's another really important principle of faith. You cannot understand the world through God's perspective, except through faith. It's very, very important. You will never, and and part of your inheritance as a believer is this, the ability to see the world a different way. Here's Here's another thing that faith gives you. Faith gives you the freedom to no longer be governed by the five senses. If you simply live by what you can see, feel, and think, and you are responding constantly to the environment around you, you will, f- you will live far below what God intended you to live. Amen. Again, back to Hebrews 11, then we'll land the plane here. 
I'm reading out of the Amplified now, so it makes it a little louder. By faith, that is with inherent trust and enduring confidence in the power and the wisdom and the goodness of God, we understand that the worlds were framed. Notice he didn't say we understand and have faith. He says we have faith that causes us to understand. Really, really important. A lot of people want to, want to get it all figured out intellectually. And God is not, a, not, God is not against your intellect. It's what, he, it's what he gave you. But your intellect cannot govern where God wants to take you. Amen. So, how do... We begin to walk this lifestyle faith that God intended us to walk in. I'm glad you asked. Principle to keep in mind is this, that God, when you came into Christ, he not only gave you a new nature, but he gave you a new way of living. It's called the kingdom of God. God is not after another religion. Jesus did not come to establish another religion. He came to establish a kingdom. And he is a king. And you are his ambassador. You are his diplomat. Do you know what a, a diplomat in the natural? When they speak in another country, they never give their opinion. When, they, when they're asked about what does your country think about, he said, the position of my country is this. And I was, just, I was just in London. When you go to a certain place in London, there's a, an embassy. It's called the United States Embassy. As soon as you step on that land, it is property of the United States. You're getting the principle. You are a diplomat of another country. But the kingdom of God is an internal reality. It's an internal reality. Jesus said, don't look here, don't look there. The kingdom of God is within you. So the kingdom of God is an internal belief system that when you learn to think like God, your outward, your, your, your outward environment begins to change. Probably one of the greatest examples of this is Genesis 39. It said Joseph was a slave in the house of Potiphar, Yet, he was prosperous and God was with him. Wait, wait, hold the phone. Hold the phone. How are you prosperous if someone else owns you, someone else can beat you, someone else can do anything they want to you? Internal belief system. And you'll notice that the prosperity did not stay on the inside. Eventually, his belief system overtook the environment he was in because God was with him. That's why I stop here. Stop right here. Really, really important for some of you. Prophetically, the enemy is a sensory devil. So he loves to define you by your present environment. He loves to go, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, pray, oh, pray, proclamation, you broke. And what he does is he tries to define you by your present circumstance, not by the seed of your belief system. And then he loves for you to come into alignment with your words. Why? Because even though he's a liar, he understands something in God. A double-minded man can receive nothing from the Lord. And he knows that God is a God of his word. And he told us death and life are in the power of your tongue. So what is really important, over 20 years of trying to walk this thing out, still learning, it's really, really important that you make a choice. I always encourage families to do this. I constantly do this. I write it in my journal almost every day. Lord, with your help, your word, and I'm telling you, to really walk out a life of faith, it takes a bold person. Ain't no wimpy Christians. The devil loves wimpy believers, wimpy preaching. Yeah, just, you know, just feel better. We want everybody, you know. I love everyone. But you come into the environment where God is. I hope, I, I hope your demons get uncomfortable. 
Isn't it amazing that Jesus cast out demons? Now we create whole church services to make people comfortable in their demons. And we tell, they tell you, that, like, brother, you can't preach for more than 30 minutes. People just can't handle it. Well, they sit eight hours for a day on their job. They can't listen to the word of God for more than 40 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> brother, brother, people don't want that in this day and age. So you're giving them what you want? I guess you're a circus act. I just believe in more in you. I do. I don't want you to leave listening to me and be a wimpy Christian. Wimpy words make wimpy Christians. I don't know why I'm saying that. I've never said. <laughs> but it's just like we have dumbed down you. Oh, they just can't handle it. No, they can handle what you can give them. You, I, I want when you leave this place, you don't have to call an elder to pray for you. Stand up and pray for yourself. And there's, not, there's nothing wrong with having someone agree with you, but eventually you've got to walk this thing out on your own. That's right. What are you going to do in the middle of the night? You know, like, oh, I'm just not going to make... No, no, you can do everything that God tells you to do. If, the, if no one's there for you, you can stand in faith. You have the word of God. You don't need to elbow your way. That's the beauty of the kingdom of God. Everything you need, you can receive by faith. You can receive your promotion by faith. You can receive everything that the ministry. It doesn't matter if they don't recognize you. God can give it to you. God overrides all that stuff. That's the beauty of faith. Everything you need, you can receive it by faith. So we want to make a consistent daily decision that you're going to trust God in every area. Amen. That you're going to live according to his word in every area. Amen. That you will do what he asks you to do. Amen. And you make that choice and then that's when the real fun begins. Because your faith moves things in the earth. And it will be challenged. I'm not going to say it's not going to be easy. But this is where it gets real fun. 20 years of walking this thing out. 20 years of seeing the goodness of God. I'm not done yet, but I've seen some things and I thank my God for it. Your internal Trust in God will change your environment. Look at two scriptures and we will land the plane. Luke 5, verse 17. Now it happened on a cert certain day, he was teaching there with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, sitting by who had come out of every town in Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought, uh, men brought a bed, a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring and lay before him. And they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd. And they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling in the midst before Jesus. That's another characteristic of faith. Faith is persistent. Verse 20. And when he saw their faith. I want to suggest to you that there was no sign on this man or his friends that had a sign that says, I'm in faith. Here's what happens when you trust what God says and not are governed by what you see. Though you're on the earth, you're seated with Christ in heavenly places. And in that place of being seated with Christ in heavenly places, you're on this earth, but you are not of this earth. You are actually heavenly men and women. And so you're walking with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit upon the earth. 
And when you see something that is out of line or you know is contrary to the word of God, you actually move heaven on your behalf and your belief and your trust in God shifts your circumstances according to the word of God. You can't see it, but it is deep in here and it actually shifts the earth for your certain good. When he saw their faith. Last one. John 2. Very well known. Oh, oh, oh here's, here's an important part about making a, a consistent daily decision to live by faith. Jesus made this statement. It's fascinating to me in John 5. He said, I only can do what I see my Father doing in heaven. And what I see him do is what I do. Why is that important? It's important because of this. We know this about Jesus. Jesus was fully God and fully man. Amen? Amen. But this is the beauty of Jesus. You want to talk about how humble and beautiful Jesus is? The God who speaks the universe into existence comes as an existed being. And you can't forgive your sister-in-law? According to Philippians 2, he chooses to live as a man. Fully God, fully man. Humbles himself and lives. That's why he's the second Adam. He's modeling what's available for us. Why am I saying that? Because Adam had a will. Excuse me, Jesus had a will. So when Jesus is making this statement, he said, I only do what I see my father doing in heaven. What's he done? He has made it his position in life that I will never violate what God asked me to do. His will is my will. I will do his will. Him and I are one. I'm a representative of him. I'm not representing myself. So see, see, this is where a lot of people, they find this challenging. Remember, we said faith is putting your complete trust in God and staking your life on it. A lot of people have plan B, C, and D if God doesn't show up for them. And then they wonder why faith isn't working for them. Because it's faith on their own terms. So if Paul says we can be exactly like Jesus, then we can actually live our way where my will becomes completely your will. I don't entertain anything outside of what you've told me to. And when you live in that place, get ready to be really stretched. You go, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me. Okay, can you do? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> That's how it works for me. God, I'm going to give in the Sea of Faith Project. Why don't you triple that? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I thought you said you'd do what I asked you to do. <laughs> I only do what you want me to do. Faith moves God's system on the earth. John 2, famous story, right? They have no, all the, all the good wine's out. Remember, Jesus only did what his father, what he saw his father doing. He goes, it's not my time yet. I want to suggest to you that this is John 2. Jesus is not lying to her. But here's a woman who's had a word from the Lord for a really long time. I believe Mary lived with the stigma her whole life. Why? They didn't believe Jesus. You think they believed her? She shows up in the synagogue one day. She's pregnant. How did this happen? The Holy Spirit. Website. 
heretic. So all her life, she's lived with this stigma, but she stays, she, she stays and she goes, this is the word of the Lord. She wasn't moved by what she sees. He tells her even that it's not my time yet. But faith shifted something in her day. And he says, what? Fill the six water pots with water. Your faith is meant to shift atmospheres. They asked Jesus this really um, interesting question. John 6, what do we need to do to do the works of God? Everybody's always focused on the outcome. What I've learned is you gotta be focused on the belief system and you'll get the right outcome. Do you know you can be really sincere, but if you think incorrectly, you will not manifest what you're sincere about? What do we need to do to do the works of God? And he says something really interesting. This is the works of God, that you may believe. What? No, 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 no. Give us the five-step model on how to pray. Show us how to pray for the sick, especially that thing with the money. How do you get the money when you need it? This is the work of God, that you may believe in him whom God has sent. Your belief system is supposed to define your world. You received this word this morning? Amen. I'm just going to count to three in a moment. And I believe there's a holy moment here. If you're with the spouse, I encourage you to do this together this morning. I'm just going to count to three. And the call is just really simple. I don't care how long you've been born again. If you just got born again. Some of you probably realize that even though you were trusting God for something, you really hadn't put your complete trust in him. But the call this morning is simply this. Today, with God's help, I'm making a choice. I'm making a decisive choice to walk by faith and not by sight as never before. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, you will never, ever regret that choice. I've never regretted trusting God for something. I have regretted not trusting him. I have regretted trying to do it in my own strength. I've had regretted trying to be my own source for something. And if you've done that, no shame, no blame, you go, God, just forgive me, and you're on your way today. So I'm just going to count to three. And if you say yes, I want once again to commit my... And, and I'm telling you, there's a marking in this room this morning. There's a marking by the Holy Spirit. There's, a, there's something about divine moments when we go, yes, Lord! It's like the Holy Spirit comes, I'll take that. I'll take your life as a living sacrifice. One, two, three. Just, just stand in this room. Would you lift your hands? I just want you to repeat this prayer. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, through your strength, I choose to walk by faith and not by sight. Thank you for the measure of faith. Thank you that my measure of faith will grow and grow and grow. I trust you, God. I trust you with my children. I trust you with my money. I trust you with my career. Thank you, Lord. Now, just wait a moment. You don't have to pray this. There's just, um, there's a power in surrender. And across this room, there's just a, a release of the peace of the Lord. Some of you will feel burdens and weights lifted right off of you. Some of you came really, really concerned today about certain things and there's whew, peace.
peace of the Lord to you. Shalom to you. Shalom to you today. Shalom to you today. Grace to you today. Peace to you today. I bless you to receive the peace of the Lord. I bless you to receive the the rest of the Lord. Therefore, there remains a rest of faith. And in this rest of faith, there's a release just from my right across to the left of just God's healing presence. Somebody's sore throat, the Lord is healing your sore throat. Be healed in Jesus' name. Somebody's lower back, the Lord is healing somebody's lower back. I'm telling you, you can actually feel the fire of God. Be healed now in Jesus' name. Somebody, even this morning, you said, I I, I just feel so confused. The Lord is delivering you of confusion. Peace to you in Jesus' name. Just another moment. The fire of God is just going, it's like a, like a snake all through this auditorium. He's just moving. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Diabetes, go in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Can you give God praise? We look this way for just a moment. Thank you very much for being patient. Stick with. Hey, I kept going because you were hungry. You're pulling it out of me. So thank you. Tonight, really, really encourage you to come tonight. I'm going to lay hands on everything that moves tonight. Your dogs, your cats. We're going to believe God. It's going to be lots of fun tonight. But uh, thank you very much. Bless you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Wow, what a wonderful, rich day in the house of the Lord. I'm going to ask you, uh, I'm going to have the ministry team come and we're going to 